Hi, you everyone. Welcome and welcome. You are tuned on to the 21st episode of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka's webinar series. Today, we are discussing a topic that involves lives and livelihood. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the topic. And these are the panel of experts that we are honored and privileged to have with us. Your topic is laws and issues related to contract of employment and superannuation benefits in the private sector. These are your experts. We have with us Mr. Susanta Balapatabandi, President's Counsel, Additional Solicitor General. Mr. Balapatabandi counts 28 years in practice, 27 of which he has served at the Attorney General's Department. He practices in the area of commercial and civil law, including writs against the determinations of the Labor Commissioner in the Court of Appeal. He has a master's, he has a master of laws degree from the Queen Mary University and has served as a visiting lecturer at numerous universities such as Slida and Ocean University. He is also an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Mr. Balapatamandi is a barrister and solicitor and a former judge of the Republic of Fiji. He currently serves as a member of the Intellectual Property Advisory Commission of the National Intellectual Property Office and as a board member of the National Child Protection Authority. We have with us Mr. Mohammed Adamali, attorney at law. Mohammed Adamali has graduated from the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo with honors from the Sri Lanka Law College with first class honors. He has been admitted as an attorney at law in 1994. Mr. Adamali also graduated from the Chartered Institute of Marketing UK. He practices in many areas of law, including commercial, labor, construction, family law, and labor. He holds, a, he holds several director posts in several companies as well. Mr. Adamali is a leading thespian and an actor in over 50 stage plays and eight films. We are also privileged to have with us Mr. Prasad De Silva, attorney at law. Mr. Prasad De Silva is the senior assistant director general, head of the plantation sector. He has over 26 years of experience in legal representation and advising members on individual relations, conflict resolution and collective bargaining. And he represents the EFC in many boards and organizations. With us is also Ms. Manoli Dinadasa, attorney at law. She has 24 years of active practice as an attorney, specializing in industrial law, constitutional and administrative law, defamation, contracts, and law on sexual harassment. She holds also many posts in several companies. And our moderator this evening, whose birthday it was a couple of days ago, happy birthday, Pasindu, he entered um, the bar in 2005, graduated from the Faculty of Science of the University of Colombo with a bachelor's degree in bioscience and was also awarded the field of ornithology, is that correct? Study of birds, I believe, group gold medal in 2005. In 2007, he enrolled as an attorney at law. He practices in several areas, including administrative law, commercial law, and labor law. He is presently the Assistant Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. And I just want to take this opportunity to very quickly, on behalf of the uh, BASL webinar team, thank you, our dear moderator, for all the effort that you put in to getting 21 episodes together. All the very best panelists, participants of the private sector, thank you for your dedication. Thank you for logging on. Have a great session. Moderator, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanya. So today's topic is laws and issues relating to uh, contract of employment and superannuation benefits in the private sector. Uh, so when, when we come to this topic, the contract of employment is very important with regard to the employee-employee relationship. There are many important aspects that relates to uh, contract of employment. And now I invite Mr. Mohammed Adamali to bring his expert views in this regard. Over to you, sir.
Yes, sir. You have to yes, I'm Bye. unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Pasindu, and thank you, Tanya. First, may I express my thanks to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for having invited me to join this panel. I must say I'm relieved to hear that we have a couple of hundred uh, registrants on this program. Uh, for a while, um, we were wondering whether it was just the five of us on the panel here who uh, were disoriented souls who were spending a wonderful Saturday afternoon flirting with the law rather than uh, in the pleasurable company of family, friends, or uh, with a drink on the beach. Uh, so it, it is nice to know that there are others who would rather spend a Saturday afternoon uh, in the company of the law. Um, I've been tasked with uh, dealing with the contract of employment, which is a huge topic and certainly too vast to try and cover uh, in great depth in this 15 minutes. But I shall try to touch on certain uh, uh, intrinsic features uh, that relate to this concept and then try and highlight some of the issues that we will face going forward. Um, when it comes to the types of contracts or the forms of contracts, and there are several, so we start with uh, perhaps the contract of employment that has the least rights for the employee, an apprenticeship, a contract of apprenticeship governed by the National Apprenticeship Act. Um, we, we have the uh, probationer, um, where uh, the employee is on a period of trial to see whether there is really a fit between the employee and the employer. And so the employee's rights are somewhat limited in terms of continuity of employment. And the employer does not really need to show uh, any cause for termination during the period of probation. Uh, his decision to terminate can only be contested on the basis of mala fides. Um, and that's also not just an allegation, but actual mala fides. So it's really uh, a period of trial um, where there is no certainty of continuity of employment into a period beyond that. Uh, we have the contract for casual employment um, where the, uh, the thinking is that it is the real character of the employment that uh, needs to be looked at, um, whether the employee was employed by chance, um, you know, his, his capacity was casual and not necessarily that the nature of the work was casual. There is a uh, a judgment that explores this idea of who is a casual employee in some depth, the Kusela State Plantation judgment. Um, and one needs to go into uh, what the nature of that employment was, whether it was uh, a casual capacity. Um, we have the uh, clearer concept of fixed term contracts where a person is employed for a particular duration only and the contract then comes to an end. Uh, at the end of that duration, it lapses by time um, and parties are free to renegotiate an extended contract thereafter. The cases of YGD Silver versus ANC stand out uh, in exploring uh, what the rights of an employee are under a fixed term contract of employment. Uh, in a recent, a more recent judgment, by Justice Shirani Telkavadana, she looked into the idea that uh, as long as the fixed term contract was not one where a dominant force sort of uh, unfairly exploited a weaker force into fixed term contracts or repeated fixed term contracts, the essence of the contract, which is that it is bound only for a particular period of time, would be upheld. Um, one then moves on into temporary employment and uh, finally, of course, into permanent contract of employment, which is the one that's perhaps most frequently used, uh, not only in this country, but all over the world. However, before we get into or, or start discussing forms of contracts, it is important, I think, to look at whether there is a contract of employment at all. And I'll spend the rest of my time actually dealing with that aspect 
uh, and we are on, on the question, on the very fundamental question of whether there is a master-servant relationship, um, a contract of service as opposed to an independent contractor relationship or a contract for services. Um, as long as both parties are in agreement that it is a contract of employment, or if they are in agreement that it is not a contract of employment, but rather an independent contractor arrangement or a consultancy, if one wants to call it that, there is no issue. The, the problem arises when one of the parties claim that it is not an independent contractor arrangement, but one of employer employee. And then the courts need to go into the system, in, into the arrangement to see what the reality is. And often it's a thin line, it's, it's a gray zone. Um, and the facts of each case would determine whether there is in fact a master servant relationship or not. Uh, many tests have evolved over time and I'll just run through the tests for your benefit. Um, you know, if a person is determined to be an employee, then of course the whole gamut of labor law would apply to that relationship, the you know, EPF Act, the ETF Act, the Industrial Disputes Act, the Payment of Gratuity Act, the Termination of Employment of Workmen's Special Provisions Act, the Workmen's Compensation Act, uh, and so on and so forth. They would become relevant only if the contract is a master servant arrangement. Um, one of the initial tests brought forward was the control test. And the control test evolved from being a question of does the employer actually control the performance of the employee to a slightly wider test, does the employer have a right of control and whether he actually exercises that control or not need not be gone into. Uh, and so facts as to whether the employer prescribes not only the work to be done, but how that work will be done, uh, directs the time at which the work will be done, the manner in which the performance would be done would become relevant. And if the, uh, if the uh, employer were able to do that, then there would be a contract of employment. So what is really important is not that the employee is looking for a result or a task, but rather is more concerned about the performance of that task and how it is performed. Um, the control test uh, was enunciated in the early 1900s, 1920s, I believe in the Performing Rights Society case in the UK and has been followed in Sri Lanka too. Uh, CMU versus the Ceylon Fertilizer Corporation, 1985 judgment, I believe, um, relied upon the control test. And in fact, it has even been cited as recent as a few years ago by the Supreme Court. Uh, the problem with the control test is that as employees become more and more skilled, the degree of control, the ability to control and sometimes perhaps even the right of control can be lost. And so the question is how relevant is the control test for uh, very skilled positions, say in IT, uh, in the medical field with surgeons, uh, with uh, you know, engineers, even lawyers for that matter, um, how much control does the employer actually um, enforce and to what extent is the right of control really present? Um, in view of these weaknesses in the control test, there was a need to evolve uh, and uh, come up with other tests. Uh, the economic reality test um, in US versus Silk uh, in the 1940s was one such uh, new approach to this question of employer employee. Um, it was followed again and cited in Sri Lanka in the Silver versus Associated Newspapers uh, and um, a 
couple of other cases as well, where the important question was, what is the economic reality of the situation? Is the employee in, in this uh, arrangement looking for profit? Uh, has he committed an investment? Does he in fact have the right to choose his own staff and does he employ his staff to do the job? Does he own the tools of the trade? Uh, and really what is, the, economically speaking, what is the role of that person in the organization? So if he is in it for a share of the profit, if he is in it with an investment, if he has some control over the selection of his own team, his staff, he owns the tools of his trade, there is a possibility that he would be held to be an independent contractor rather than an employee. And so the question essentially is, as a matter of economic reality, was he in business of his own, on his own? Or was he in business, uh, or was he really serving the cause of the employer? Uh, perhaps the most frequently used test that has evolved is uh, from the judgment of Lord Denning in Stevenson, Jordan and Harrison versus McDonnell. Uh, where he introduced the integration test. And the integration test looks to see whether the person who claims to be an employee is really integral to the organization. Is he employed as part of this business? Is the role that he performs essential uh, or at the core of the business? And if it is so, then he is considered to be an employee. Whereas if his role is really collateral, uh, distinct, different from the role of the business, and he's not really functioning as part of this business organization, then he could be considered a, a supplier or an independent contractor uh, in, a, in a contract for services. In Sri Lanka, Pereira versus Marika Baba, which is an interesting case, it dealt with uh, the role of a head cutter in a tailoring operation. The question was, is his role integral to the whole tailoring business? And the court was pleased to use the integration test to determine that he was so. Uh, again, this uh, principle was cited and endorsed in De Silva versus Associated Newspapers and a whole host of other cases. Now, what I want to do is to look at some of the more recent judgments, uh, 2010 and beyond, and to see what the view of our courts have been in this regard. So there was an interesting judgment of Justice Chandra Ekanayaka in uh, Singer Industries, which uh, took a different approach and went strongly along the lines of what does the contract itself say? And it went on the basis that in the modern context, um, where there is reasonably equal bargaining power, the contract would hold supreme. And if the contract really identifies the person as an independent contractor, then that must be given due weight. Uh, it's a, a judgment that hasn't really been dealt with thereafter uh, and is unusual because that amount of emphasis on the contractual arrangement and the contractual document has not been placed by judgments before. There were two interesting cases in 2016 and 2017, both involving the Sri Lanka Insurance Corporation. One, an appeal from a labor tribunal, and uh, one was by way of writ. Um, both involving the Sri Lanka Insurance Corporation and both involving a professional uh, category of employee, um, the uh, motor assessors, those who go out there and assess the damage done and uh, try and identify whether the loss was in fact caused in the manner in which an insurance um, and, and insured uh, set out when he made a claim. So these assessors, the insurance corporation claimed were independent contractors and not employees because they were professionally qualified and were given work only depending on the availability of work. 
Uh, and it's interesting because two different sets of judges in the Supreme Court heard these matters. And one judgment was delivered um, in uh, 2016 by Justice Anil Gunaratna, and the other by uh, Justice Eva Vanasundara in 2017. And both judgments used very similar tests to determine this. Uh, they cited the control test and the integration test as being the paramount factors. And it's interesting to look at what factors they considered because it brings me to the last point that I want to leave with you. Uh, so let me look at the, or share with you the, the main factors that influenced the courts in holding that these professionally qualified motor assessors were in fact employees of the insurance corporation. Uh, they looked at what is the main business of the company. It was insurance, and it was motor insurance that they were talking about in this case. Uh, motor insurance involves payment of claims on accidents. And so this, uh, this role of the assessor in identifying the genuineness of the claim, the extent of the damage, was integral to the business of motor insurance. They also looked at the tools of the trade, um, what equipment had been provided to these people, like recorders and things. The fact that the motor assessors were required to look after the interests of the company, and so they were not truly independent. The fact that they reported to work daily, and this was a particularly important fact, that they reported to work daily and they had to come in by a particular time uh, if not, they would not be considered for work that day. Uh, the fact that they had to submit deadlines, uh, sorry, re reports by certain deadlines. The fact that the report that they submitted had to cover certain uh, information, uh, extent of damage, nature of damage, photographs, etc. The fact that they had to sign in a register when they reported to work the fact that they were subject to disciplinary action if they did not comply with these rules, uh, and the fact that their service had to be somewhat exclusive to the corporation. Now, these were factors that were taken into account under the control test and the integration test. Now, the problem that I see going forward is this, uh, and I brought this up at a forum a couple of years ago, in the Faculty of Law, actually, a forum that was a panel that was held there. And that is that we see, and we have seen for the last few years, a growing trend of uh, independence amongst people who are employed by companies. Uh, the, the younger generation is one that values this independence. And the nature of work, the set of skills that people bring to the table uh, are such that this independence is required if they are to function properly and smoothly and effectively. Uh, today, with the post-COVID scenario, or rather, we're still in the midst of COVID, but uh, post-commencement of COVID scenario, we find that uh, you know, the dynamics of the workplace have changed entirely we find this idea of work from home becoming the norm. Um, we find that technology is exploited to a, a different level in terms of working. We find over the last few years, companies relying more and more on outsourcing. And they're outsourcing not only collateral work, but also beginning to outsource some co-work, some uh, functions which are fundamental or core to the business of the organization. They're beginning to outsource it, outsource it not just to companies in the neighborhood, but even outsource it to companies across the seas. Now with this happening, with working from home, greater reliance on technology and the support of technology, and this whole idea of outsourcing. The question that comes to the fore is how relevant are these tests, the control test, the integration test in particular, in 
the workplace today and in the workplace tomorrow. So if one looks at some of those factors that were considered important in those two decisions in 2016 and 2017, such as signing the attendance register, how does that apply if you're working from home? Reporting to work daily at a particular time, how does that work and how is that monitored? How is that going to be controlled? Are those even relevant in a work from home environment? Then the fact that insurance was the main business and so the assessing of damages is a part of the core and therefore a person who assesses the damages must be considered an employee. How will that be relevant? How will that test be applicable if the company outsources the entire area of assessing of damages to a different company, to a company that specialized in assessments, in analysis. Now we see that happening very often. I mean, we, we see financial companies worldwide outsourcing financial analysis to a more research-based organization. We see tea companies, tea exporting companies in Sri Lanka outsourcing the entire packing operation to a contract packing company, a company which has invested huge monies in you know, very expensive tea packing machinery, and they do the entire packing for the exporter. Now, the, the packing of the tea, the blending and the packing of the tea is core to the business of exporting tea. And yet, we cannot fathom that the employees of the packing company will be considered to be employees of the tea exporting company. That would be inconceivable in the, the, the broader framework of outsourcing. So going forward, there will be huge challenges in identifying uh, you know, whether a person is in fact engaged in a master-servant relationship uh, using the traditional tests that have been expounded so far. And uh, new factors might have to be considered uh, if we are to identify the employee because going forward with the existing tests, most employees would fail because one would find that um, the, the traditional tests simply do not apply. There is no attendance, there is no reporting to work, there are no fixed hours, even core business is outsourced, etc. And so a far more flexible approach would have to be taken. I think that uh, sort of covers what I wanted to share with you and some of the thoughts I want to leave with you to, to discuss and open for discussion. Um, okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, sir, you. thank you very I much. I didn't overstep my time. No, sir, you just finished in time. Uh, Thank you. So next, I will uh, move on to our next uh, expert panelist, is Manoli Jinadasa. Uh, another important aspect uh, interwoven with contract of employment is the termination of uh, employment. Uh, so, madam, you may express your views with regard to termination of employment. Thank you, Pasindu, and thank you, Bar Association, for giving us this opportunity to place these matters before this forum and also opportunity to discuss with uh, fellow professionals. Uh, termination of employment, the termination aspect itself is a huge area, which obviously can't be covered in 15 minutes. So I will broadly categorize it into two areas. That will be the, ter the disciplinary terminations and the non-disciplinary termination of services. That's the broadest kind of categorization that I can make. Now, in the present situation, because I thought rather than going into the basics and the academics of it, we should uh, focus on the problematic areas right now in the current COVID-19 situation and how to uh, sort of find solutions to the problems we have with regard to terminations. So in that sense, I think the most important aspect is a non-disciplinary termination as opposed to a disciplinary termination because I find with the COVID-19 situations, the businesses of this country, a lot of employers are facing a lot of difficulties in sustaining their businesses and therefore a lot of questions have been posed to us lawyers as to how can we affect uh, terminations, reductions of staff, then what is the situation in a closure situation where we have to close our businesses and so on and so forth. So I will 
focus mainly on non-disciplinary terminations today, and I will touch very briefly on the disciplinary terminations of services. Now, where the non-disciplinary terminations are concerned, how do we affect a non-disciplinary termination? It is ideal, the ideal situation is for both the employer and the employee, of course, to agree on a mutual package and effect the termination. So when that happens, it is very easy where both parties come together, they agree on mutual terms and conditions. But even then, sometimes after agreeing to the mutual kind of beneficial uh, uh, a very beneficial package, the employee tends to thereafter seek relief once again, especially in the, before the labor tribunals or sometimes by way of complaints to the labor department. So when a company especially is looking uh, to uh, terminate an employee and the, that termination is with consent, even if it's with consent, as uh, I, I would always advise a company to either get into a settlement agreement or to have an agreement under Section 12.1 of the Industrial Disputes Act before the Commissioner of Labor. Now, a lot of companies are reluctant to go before the Commissioner of Labor. They prefer to negotiate with the employee and come into a mutual agreement. So in such case, a settlement agreement is the best way forward. And in that settlement agreement, I always take the precaution of advising them to get a letter from the uh, employee's counsel or ask the employer to employee to uh, get the settlement agreement read and explained by a lawyer and to have a small certification where the lawyer certifies that the terms and conditions of such a settlement agreement had been explained to the workman. That has pro proven to be very effective where I find that thereafter if the workman challenges the agreement saying that I was forced to sign this, I was these benefits were forced upon me and then my uh, employment was discontinued, I find that the fact that a lawyer had gone through the agreement and explained the conditions to the workman is a uh, acceptable uh, kind of uh, factor to the courts and the courts and also to the labor department and in certain instances where practically this has happened they have considered the fact that this settlement agreement had actually been explained to the workman by a lawyer so i would always advise the companies to take the precaution if they don't want to go before the labor uh, commission of labor and the employee agrees to accept some benefit and term, uh, uh, give his resignation still to enter into a proper agreement where the terms and conditions are very clearly set out and the employee also to be advised by a lawyer. Then, of course, section 12.1 agreements. For me, that is the best sort of agreement where even if when the workman agrees uh, to a certain package, yet to go before the labor commissioner, and enter into a 12-1 agreement. Why I say this is section 12-1 agreement prevents the workman from thereafter trying to seek more benefits before another forum. And in that sense, a very recent judgment of Next Manufacturing Private Limited versus Jaya Sundara, the Supreme Court very clearly held, and that judgment is, I think, uh, was delivered on 9 June 2020, that's just this year, where the Supreme Court categorically held that any person who enters into a section 12-1 agreement cannot go before a liberty tribunal. Because in that case, what happened was the workman, after accepting a section 12-1 agreement, still filed action before the labor tribunal. And the labor tribunal actually granted relief saying that what he got under the Section 12.1 agreement was not sufficient. But the Supreme Court very clearly held, no, once you enter into a Section 12.1 agreement, you cannot go before the Labor Tribunal. So therefore, with regard to a situation where both the employer and employee agrees uh, to mutually part ways, I would still say it is always better to go before the Labor Department and enter Section 12.1 agreement failing which at least have your own agreement, settlement agreement, whereby the steps are very clearly set out and the benefits of whatever the relief granted is clearly set out and read and explained by a lawyer. So that is as far as a situation where both the employee and the employer have agreed to part ways. But what happens in a closure situation? 
and what happens where uh, the employer due to frustration of business has to let go of people. Now, with regard to a closure situation or where the employer must let go of people and the employee is not agreeable to part ways, then of course, we have to contemplate what's the applicable law. And that is the termination of employment act, where if the employee does not consent and the workforce is over 15 people, then you can make an application to the Commissioner of Labor and try and get his permission because permission is not guaranteed. The Commissioner of Labor will look at the circumstances and we'll see whether the business as a whole or part of the business is going to close or what the difficulty is. And depending on the circumstances, we'll give permission. Now, right now, we have a compensation formula in place. So because of that, any employer going before the Commissioner of Labor has an idea of how much of compensation one has to pay depending on the uh, service period of the employee. So it is quite easy for the employer to figure out what kind of liability that he is facing because if permission is given, it is always as per the statute and nothing else. So I always tend to recommend to the employer that they actually adopt this course and go before the commissioner and pay the proper compensation and effect a termination where the employees do not agree. Now that is on the part of the employer. But as far as the employees are concerned, one actually wonders whether this benefits them in the long run. I'm especially talking about the middle man management because the compensation formula has a ceiling of 1.25 million. So however long you have worked, you are subject to that 1.25 million ceiling. So when we are looking at it from a point of view of an employee, most often than not, some of the employees may not get an advantage of going before the Commissioner of Labor. So then the employee must consider what are the other options. Labor tribunal is one such option where labor tribunal is not bound by this compensation formula, but can, they can determine just compensation. Now, where labor tribunals are concerned, yes, for big employers, where big companies are concerned, I think when they do decide on what is just and equitable, that is a fair judgment to both the employer and the employee. But what about those small businesses where the, the workforce is less than 15? Why the act imposed this particular ceiling of less than 15 employees is a labor tribunal must always consider what is just and equitable to both parties. And when it comes to smaller businesses, they may not be able to pay according to the formula because the, the business itself is very small and it can't be sustained if you pay this kind of money if the part of the business has to close. So then the labor tribunals must look at both the employer situation and the employee situation. And I find regrettably that it doesn't happen in some cases because the labor tribunal also tends to follow this compensation formula. And even for small businesses think that the minimum level is the compensation formula. I think that is food for thought for all of us to think that when it, why the termination act has this clause which says over 15 employees and if it is less one could go to the labor tribunal and when one goes before the labor tribunal the labor tribunal must look at the size of the business as well as other factors and then make a order which is just and equitable to both parties so that is something we are as as lawyers also we have to impress upon the labor tribunal the the reason behind putting this clause of 15 employees and more now, another aspect which is very relevant on the present day is the frustration of the contract. What happens when the contract gets frustration, frustrated? For example, presently in the tourist industry, there are several small hotels which just can't sustain because there are no foreigners and there are associated businesses which are dependent on tourists and which we don't know when they will be able to open again or whether they will be able to run the business at all because with such a big break and with no tourists coming they just can't sustain the business so in situation like that the business collapses not due to the fault of the employer or the employee the business collapses because of 
other reasons. For example, by law, there can be prohibitions for large scale gatherings, which affect the business. And there are, if it's a business which involves large, large scale, scale gatherings, like entertainment industry or something, how do we go forward? So when, it when it's a contract which is frustrated, is the employer liable to pay compensation? Now, when we look at the past cases of what, how the courts have handled this, especially there was a case of Salaka where they were having a gambling operation and all of a sudden a gazette was issued prohibiting this operation. So then the workers were asked to go back home because there was no work because the law has prohibited this operation. So then the workers went before the labor tribunal. Now, what the labor tribunal did then was they didn't grant compensation for wrongful termination, but all of them got three months salary as a compensation on the basis that although the labor tribunal, uh, generally the labor tribunal grants compensation for wrongful termination, there have been instances where although the termination is correct and just and has occurred due to the frustration, the labor tribunal can still award some compensation. But all, what, all of them got was three months salary, just as a sort of a gratuity or a kind of ex-gratia payment. So where there's frustration of contract, which is not due to the fault of the employer or the employee, then the courts will look at it in a, a more relaxed attitude. And there are certain cases like, for example, if the employee cannot perform his contract due to illness or maybe due to imprisonment, then the employer does not have to pay at all because the, the, the contract is frustrated, not due to any fault of the employer, and it is in fact due to a certain differences of the employee. Now, when we talk of the frustration of contract, however, if the frustration occurs, but due to some kind of factor which is self-inflicted, where the employer brings, a, brings it upon himself and as a consequently, there is frustration of contract, then of course the employer is somewhat liable and courts have in certain cases here that it is because of the employer's negligence that the frustration has occurred and they're entitled to compensation. For example, there was a case where the, there was a, a strike and then the, 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 the uh, employees were terminated and the building was burned down. Now the building was burned down so they couldn't have operations and there was a frustration. But the employees were terminated just prior to the burning and it, it was all one incident. Now there they held that the employer was also liable for causing the whole uh, strike between the employees and the employer and there the compensation had to be paid. So the frustration of employment also is a way of uh, termination of employment, but in that case, depending on the facts and circumstances of the case, there are certain instances where the employer can not refrain from paying compensation and courts have upheld that. Then with regard to termination of employment, a lot of employers tend to pose the question, there is a notice period in the contract of employment, why can't we give notice and terminate the contract? Now, in industrial law, I think this everybody by now knows in industrial law, the provisions of a contract, the terms and conditions of a contract of employment are not uh, relied upon by labor tribunals and other industrial forums such as arbitrations, because they say that the employer and the employee are not on an equal bargaining position at the time of entering into contracts. Now, I think we discussed this with Mr. Edmeli also the other day. Uh, this is, Actually, uh, uh, I would say a very con there are conflicting provisions. For example, where a retirement uh, clause is concerned, where at the beginning you put the age of retirement at fifty-five, that clause is upheld, and and once you enter, uh, once you reach the age of fifty-five, most often the right of the employer to retire you is upheld by courts, but not the notice period clause where you can give notice and terminate the employment. So there is a bit of discussion on this, whether why then uphold the retirement clause and not the notice clause. So whether it is just and equitable by the employer to say, no, we are not going to uphold this clause, but we'll uphold this, the, the, the retirement clause. So 
where notice is concerned that notice clause will be relevant if the employee goes before a district court for damages for wrongful termination of his contract because there the employer can rely on the notice clause and say that they have acted in terms of the contract. But before any industrial forum, the notice clause is not considered as a relevant call clause and the courts will look at the just the just and equitable nature of the termination so in industrial law the employer must not rely on this notice clause to give notice and terminate and but of course it will it's applicable to the employee where the employee wants to terminate the contract then of course the notice clause is upheld and they have to give notice as per the notice clause uh, or that amount can be deducted from their salary so with regard to uh, uh, the the termin the non disciplinary terminations those are the aspects that i will be dealing in and of course the fixed term contracts whereas the fixed term contract uh, contra contract is concerned obviously there's a very specific period for which it is entered into and upon reaching the end of the contract they say it is terminated due to effluxion of time and not by the employer then the question arises, as Mr. Adamelli also touched on this, whether continuous contracts of employment constitutes permanent employment. I would like to think that it depends on the terms and conditions of each contract as well as the surrounding circumstances. For example, this kind of expectation of a renewed or continued fixed term contract can be entertained by people who are less than say 55 or 60 or less who haven't reached their re retirement age but after one reaches the mandatory age of retirement most often than not the employer tends to keep them on on fixed term contracts depending on of course the business requirements and also certain other factors for example if the worker is very good or but they think that he's useful for the business, one tends to keep them on fixed term contracts. Then the fact that you keep renewing the fixed term contract doesn't necessarily mean that the person can go on forever. So generally when one looks at the concept of fix, uh, continuous or maybe several fixed term contracts would constitute a permanent contract of employment, there are certain other external factors that a court must consider. Because automatically, just because you are given another fixed term contract doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the person can ex uh, have a legitimate expectation of continuous employment. For example, if it's on a project and if it's a project based contract, once the project is over, then there is no, no business. So then one can't expect continued employment in a project. So furthermore, in a fixed term contract, there are certain other factors like for example an expert one is retained for a particular job although the business will continue it is a expert's job and you're there only for a fixed term contract until that job is fulfilled and sometimes there can be an extension or two but once that particular expertise is no longer required then the employer must have the freedom to end that contract by the fraction of time so in a fixed term contract another aspect i would like to touch um, yeah uh, madam just the time is a little bit uh, passing if you can conclude in yes. one minute or so we'll move in the question and answer one. session madam. Yes. Thanks. yeah so one i would like to touch on about fixed term contracts is which forum should it be canvassed if the fixed term contract has uh ended due to reflection of time i would suggest one should go before the uh labor department for arbitration or even before the district court rather than the labor tribunal because the labor tribunal the termination can be only uh, sorry in the labor tribunal the jurisdiction can be invoked only on a termination of services by the employer and in a fixed term contract it doesn't uh, the termination is not by the employer but due to fluction of time where I, I don't think i'll have time to touch on disciplinary uh, terminations maybe during the question and answer session if any questions arises i'll answer it thank you very much uh, uh, thank you very much madam now uh, next next we'll move to our th third panelist mr susanta balapata by the persons council Sir, now with regard to the judicial pronouncements, they play an important role in determining 
the rights of parties under the topic that we are discussing today. Sir, can you please enlighten our viewers on some of these very important decisions and some of the important factors relating to contract of employment, such as earnings and uh, statutory exclusions? Over to you, sir. Thank you, Pasindo. Uh, I'll also take this opportunity to thank the Bar Association for giving me this opportunity to uh, share in insights on this topic. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Adamali uh, very clearly explained uh, the distinction between the contract of services and the contract for services, who is a worker, who is an employee, and who is an independent consultant. So I'm not going to touch on that. Now, once the decision is made that the particular worker is an employee, uh, and his contract services are terminated. Uh, and quite often in the court of appeal, there are, we have observed that there are a lot of writ applications on the basis that uh, the, the certain exclusions not to plead the particular statute is being challenged because the labor commissioner, uh, after an inquiry holds that the particular employee uh, is entitled to EPF, although in the contract of employment, uh, specifically states that he is not entitled for any superannuation benefits. So what is the legality of it? Now, if you sign a contract uh, with an employer agreeing not to claim superannuation benefits, and after the expiration of your contract of employment, or after the termination, whether the employee can complain to the Labor Commissioner and ask for EPF. So what is the legality of such clauses? Now, there are a lot of applications on this uh, in the Court of Appeal. And uh, let me go into some of these cases. Now, uh, as you know, there were early cases on this particular point, but the blank diamond private limited versus employees trust fund case, uh, Supreme Court appeal number 120 of 97, decided on uh, 6 5 1998. There, the court held that such clauses are against the public policy. And therefore, even if the parties have uh, agreed upon, uh, there's no validity of such clauses. In most of the cases, we have observed that the uh, petitioners, that the employers take up the position that uh, one cannot uh, admit and deny, one cannot agree and disagree. We call it in law, uh, probate and reprobate. So they take up that position. And sometimes they take up the uh, arguments that the doctrine of wave applies because you have agreed to not to claim. Now, therefore, wave applies. You have renounced your rights. So whether whether such clause is valid in law, or you have not claimed this, or you have not brought to the notice of labor commissioner or the employer over the period of last so many years during the term of your contract. Now, whether the estoppel operates against such clause. So what is the validity of such clauses? Now, uh, after the uh, blank diamonds uh, case, the employees trust fund versus uh, uh, that is uh, Ceylon Agro Industries Limited versus Employees Trust Fund uh, case, the court appeal has gone into this issue once again and held with the, uh, uh, the judgment in the blank diamond case. And also uh, due to the time constraint, I will, uh, uh, no, there was another one particular case, uh, the Lanka Marine Services was Ports Authority case. Uh, Justice Sri Pavan uh, briefly went into this issue, but not in a contract of employment. There he held, uh, I will just read the relevant paragraph of that particular contract. Having regard to the established principles, the statute being the superior reflects the will of the legislature and takes the priority over the agreement. So he briefly explained about if there's a conflict between the statute and the agreement, which supersedes the other. But of course, when you go into the principles of contract law, it may not so, uh, it may not so, but let, let me let me uh, uh, highlight you on a paragraph in the Law of Contract Viramantri book. Now, in the uh, page uh, uh, 797, the Law of Contract Viramantri, as we all know, that is a book that we often use uh, for Law of Contract uh, uh, Disputes, agreement not to plead limitation. That is, that it is not contrary to the public policy for parties to enter into an agreement not to plead limitation. So there are the Justice Viramantri says that there is a possibility not to plead the statute in a contract, provided that particular statute does not affect the public policy. So he held that the limitation is not a public policy issue. 
For example, if you take the insurance contracts, uh, there's a clause to the effect that the, whenever there's a dispute between the parties with regard to insurance contract, the parties must uh, uh, demand the money or claim the money within the period of three months, inform the insurer within the period of three months. But of course, it's a written contract and the time period is six years. So they have reduced the uh, time limitation from six years to three months. There are several case laws on this, Helen Lack Garments versus HNB, uh, Ratnayaka versus Selinko insurance case. There are so many cases on this, on the basis that the limitation, the time bar is not a public policy issue and the parties can plead. Now, uh, the same position was there in the Chittion contracts. That is another contract law book, which we often use. There also, the uh, Chitti uh, says, the agreement not to plead the statute also states in section 28 to section 80 page 1, 1365 that the express or implied agreement not to plead statute, whether made before or after the limitation period expired is valid, supported by consideration. So there, even the Chitti on contract says, you can plead, you can have a clause defect that you are not pleading the statute, but so long as the statute does not affect the public policy. So in a very recent case, uh, in the, uh, Court of Appeal uh, went into uh, uh, a, a clause in the uh, contract of employment with a foreign national. So I'd like to read the relevant paragraph on in the particular uh, contract of employment. There it says, uh, in so far as matter is not specifically regulated in this contract, the contract of employment as per the Austrian civil code shall be used in addition. Austrian public labor social and collective bargaining law, including the industrial construct, constitution law are not applicable on principle. So if you go into that particular contract, Manoli you know better than me because she's the petition of the council, uh, petition as council, the governing law of that contract was the Austrian law. The proper law of the contract was Austrian law. So the issue came up whether the EPF Act applies to this particular contract or not. Now, there are so many judgments on this particular issue, but the court has never applied the conflict of law principles to decide whether the governing law of the contract was the Austrian law or the, whether the EPF Act being, uh, 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 they call it a, a, a superior law, whether it applies or not. So court has gone into a lot of conflict of law principles to decide which law should apply to that particular contract of employment. So finally, the court held in that particular case, the irrespective of uh, it's, being, it's being governing or proper law, being the Austrian law, the EPF Act applies. So this is, a, I mean, there are so many other issues which the court has gone into. Uh, I mean, a court, and also you have to consider so many other factors as well. But of course, this is the, the case where the courts have gone into the principles of conflict of law, other than this public policy issue or perspective. So once the uh, uh, decision is made, whether the particular employee is entitled for EPF or not, I will uh, go into another small area in the law where there's a new development uh, in law. Uh, once the decision is made, as you know, you have several options. Either you can uh, file a certificate under 38.2 when it comes to EPF in the magistrate court, or you can excise section 17. There are so many options available for the uh, employer once the determination is made by the Labor Commissioner. Now in the 38.2 certificate cases, the certificate is filed against the company. And once the fine is not paid, the default sentence kicks in. Now, who should go to jail in the event if the fine is not paid? Now, EPF, let's assume that the EPF default period was not the last preceding year, but the default period was very much before. So should you make the directors who defaulted five years back, or should you make the directors a party to go to jail, the current directors? Now, this issue also, uh, 
the courts have gone into in, in one of these cases recently. Uh, there are two judgments on this particular point. Now they are the, in one of the cases, I'll give you the reference on this, uh, Randa Singh versus Commissioner General of Labor, uh, CAPHC 16 of 2009, CA minutes 27 January 2011. There the Justice uh, Cecilia Abru held that if the employer is a body corporate, and if it does not comply with the section 382 of the EPF Act, how is the magistrate going to implement the default sentence? In short, the question must be considered is if the employee is a body corporate and the amount ordered by way of a fine is not paid, who is going to be sent to jail? Obviously, the magistrate cannot send the body corporate to jail. If the contention that the directors of the body corporate cannot be sent to jail, as they have not committed an office is accepted, then the amount set out in the certificate cannot be recovered. Was this the intention of the legislature when it enacted Section 38.2 of the EPF Act? of the statute? The answer is clearly no. So what he says is, taking into consideration section 40 of the EPF Act, it is the current directors, the way that it has been uh, uh, delivered, it is the current directors. And uh, in a subsequent case, uh, Stitcher's case, private, Stitcher's private limited case, uh, CAPHC 140 of 2014, uh, the court uh, held with Justice Cecil Dabru's judgment. So this is a, uh, I mean, as we know, in, in, in criminal law, the liability arises on the person who defaulted, not the person who is currently on the board. Okay, so that is the one scenario. The other scenario is, let's assume that the application is filed in the magistrate court under section six of the TEVA, section seven of the TEVA. Now that is filed under 136 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Now, when you file an action under 136, that is a plan before the magistrate court and it should there should be a summary trial and there should be a conviction, unlike a certificate case. In terms of this, uh, as per the Diavati's case, uh, in certificate cases, there's no conviction. And one cannot consider the certificate cases as a criminal action. But when you file the action under 136, it is construed as a criminal action. Now, when it comes to a criminal action, is it mandatory to make the directors a party in the charge sheet itself? Now, answer to that is there in the very recent judgment by the Supreme Court in the uh, uh, Foreign Employment Bureau case, I'll give you the reference of that particular case. Uh, this was by Justice Aluihare, uh, Supreme Court Appeal uh, number 201 of 2014. This judgment was delivered on 15th March 2018. There they say, by applying the principles of ICCPR Act, everyone who is who could be convicted in a criminal case should be made a party should be made a party. And once the magistrate convicts the directors of the company, whether the directors have a right of appeal or not. Now, if you go by the statutes, all the labor related statutes, the right of appeal is not provided. Right of appeal is not provided. Now, if you go by the cases coming, starting from Martin versus Vijayawadana, the right of appeal is statutory right. And the particular statute should provide the right of appeal. Otherwise, the remedy available is a revision. Now, if you go by the TEVA, the right of appeal is not provided. But before the magistrate, there's a criminal trial. But this is a case where just Alvihari applied the ICCPR Act principles and said that if there is a conviction, whether the statutes provide the right of appeal or not, every person whose liberty is taken away is entitled for right of appeal. It need not be specifically provided when it comes to criminal appeal. So every person who could be convicted has a right to be heard. Every person who is dissatisfied with the order of the magistrate against the conviction 
can file an appeal. So these are the important points. This is this is quite different to the normal uh, uh, right of appeal and right to revision. How do you distinguish between revision and uh, appeal? So all these years we have been take, relying on this Martin versus Vijayavadana's case and and subsequent case which relied on Martin versus Vijayavadana said that it's a statutory right, but it is no longer a statutory right. The right emanated from the ICCPR Act. Section four is very clear on that. So please bear, ensure, make sure that the ICCPR Act now is in operation and the courts have considered the ICPR, ICCPR Act principles uh, for even uh, labor related statutes. So I hope I have taken more than 50 minutes, Masidu. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, now, now I will move, move to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Prasad De Silva, who will discuss on some very important matters relating to uh, superannuation benefits. Over to you, sir. Uh, sir, sir, you are muted. Uh, you can now unmute yourself. Right. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I think I should uh, straight away get into the subject without much ado. But still, I think it's my duty to say a big thank you to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for providing this opportunity to the Employers Federation of Ceylon to be a part of this uh, 21st webinar of the BSF. So the topic that have been given to me today is the superannuation benefits and label and reforms. I think there cannot be a better time, more opportune time to discuss this because we, uh, I mean, being at the Employees Federation of Ceylon, we see how the employers are failing these days, especially because of this uh, endemic, right? Which has uh, really questioned the very, very sustenance of industries and the businesses. So um, having said that, all of us know that in the private sector, they, everybody says private sector is the engine of the economic drive of the country. But then unlike in the public sector, the private sector employees are not benefited from a pension scheme. All they can depend on is the employees provident fund, which is the superannuation benefit per se. Of course, when we talk about superannuation benefits, we talk about the ETF and gratuity, which in actual fact cannot be considered uh, uh, superannuation benefits because it's not contributory, because uh, it's only the, or rather the employee only contributes. So all the ILO conventions which talk about uh, uh, superannuation benefits stress on the importance of uh, contribution by other stakeholders such as government and perhaps uh, uh, the, the employees themselves. So anyway, um, we are you know, uh, looking at a time where the entire demography right, of uh, world of work is changing. Yes, earlier it used to be very traditional, the eight hour work, working in the office environment, Mr. Adamali touched on this. The world of work is radically changed. You see the, uh, the virtual office, telecommuting, working from home, flexible hours, so on and so forth. And uh, the traditional tests, therefore, have proved to be rather inadequate in determining uh, the employee employee relationship now. And also, we, can, we have to be mindful of the fact that the millennials are now entering into the workforce and they value independence. They do not you know, uh, like the idea of being confined to the office environment, uh, environment and having you know, bosses and you know, taking orders and things like that because when we conducted symposium, we had these millennials voice in these kind of concerns and I wonder whether Mr. Ademali was there on that day. Okay, anyway. So those were the concerns that were voiced by the uh, representatives that we had from the 
million years. Right? So it's going to be a very complex thing. Now we see very, very traditional uh, roles like teaching, which used to be the classroom, blackboard, chalk kind of teaching has also now, you know, moved to this online teaching and things like that. So uh, superannuation benefits, therefore, as a question, okay, if it is difficult to determine whether there is an actual employee-employee relationship, then how is this superannuation benefit going to be decided? Firstly, there has to be established that there is an employee-employee relationship. And um, we, we see uh, due to this uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, losses of employment, loss of earning. Uh, actually, what, what I would like to suggest is that the authority should very closely look at having a social security fund because which, which can address temporary loss of income and long-term losses of income. That is also very important because to get this superannuation benefit, one has to wait till he, he or she re reaches the retirement age. And of course, there are a few exceptional situations where when a person is you know, certified by a doctor, a medical practitioner to be incapable of performing the job and you know, migrating, joining the government sector, so on and so forth. But basically, it, they have to wait till they uh, attain the retirement age. And the ET effect, which is uh, contributed only by the employer, right, is to you know, soften this cushion, the loss of employment. Gratuity is yet another payment. And these laws themselves have to be looked at you know, if you are talking about labor law reforms. The, uh, gratuity law, I mean, if I uh, take a moment to discuss about the gratuity law, I look after the plantations at the Employees Federation of Ceylon, and the plantation companies have a huge liability when it comes to payment of gratuity because the employees themselves have kept their names in the plantations and you know report to a, a very limited number of days so that they just can keep, keep their names in the check roll and they go out to work for a better pay. One can say, one can argue that it's a management issue, but you know, when you think about the plantation community, the life, uh, the, the entire you know, structure there, it's not an easy thing, it is easier said than done. So these people uh, work sometimes, work some days, keep the name in the check roll, but continue to work elsewhere. Right? They come to Colombo and all the, from 1992 when the estates were privatized, they said it's been 100,000 people who have out-migrated last year alone. It have been over 10,000. So uh, the names are there. They continue to live in the, you know, live in estates, but then this liability continues in spite of the fact that they are not working the, uh, a particular number of days. So in that sense, the Employees Federation of Ceylon has proposed at the National Labor Advisory Council that at least 180 days of work per year should be the qualification for someone to be entitled for payment of gratuity. Of course, I must say this has been, you know, uh, kind of very positively looked at by the trade union, the employee trade unions, and also. Uh, the Honorable Minister himself. So we will hope and see that the uh, labor law in relation to gratuity will be reformed in that way. And uh, the Employees Trust Fund, uh, it has provisions uh, for self-employed people to be, you know, uh, members of it. But, the, uh, but it's worthwhile looking at it, how many of them are aware of this and how many of them have made use of this opportunity given. So we are looking at uh, the various uh, uh, work arrangements, new work arrangements where people value their independence, they would like to you know, do, or do the work on assignment basis, not, not bound by employment contracts per se. So uh, 
uh, we will have to see how these people could be you know covered and once again the employees provident fund yeah. unless there is an employee employee relationship there are no provisions to cover these independent workers or people like so these laws have to be reformed because uh, uh, traditionally uh, our laws have been you know framed in such a way that the responsibilities are always given to the uh, employers now if you look if you look at uh, the termination of employment of workmen sect number 45 of 1971 the, uh, the employment may come to an end and uh, establishment may get closed not due to the fault of the employer himself always uh, due to a host of reasons that can come to an end uh, the, but nevertheless the employer has to you know end up paying them compensation like uh, manoli mentioned 1.25 million and there are cries you know that has to be the ceiling has to be taken away and things like that it it will be interesting it will be interesting to look at what our neighboring country is doing i think in india uh, the, the middle level management who are earning more than uh, 100000 indian rupees i accept it so there has to be something like that and uh, even other uh, laws such as uh, you know maternity benefits ordinance okay? so the it is the liability of the employer to make payments uh, no contribution by anybody is the employer has to you know give the paid leave and in the uh, case of plantation they have to make payments so on and so forth and now the benefits have been enhanced so i am not uh, you know i am talking from the employer's perspective being from the employers federation of ceylon but you know i am not against any of these things personally but you know sri lanka uh, is uh, having a problem our uh, female labor force participation is awfully low i think it staggers around 37% or something so these kind of uh, things will uh, you know uh, i don't know uh, what can i say for the employers to you know give preference to male employees or females i mean what i am trying to say is it can be counterproductive to female employee generation so uh, the covid 19 situation once again manoli touched on this um, uh, have has forced uh, some of the companies to lay off employees for no fault of theirs no fault of the employee no fault of the employees themselves but then they are bound to pay their wages uh, they are bound to you know uh, obl- i mean honor the contractual obligations so on and so forth there is no social security fund as i mentioned earlier to cover situations of temporary loss of employment uh, employment or income or even longer period because you don't you never know how long this is going to be you never know how the, how long it will take for the for certain industries to you know come back to what we what it was so i think this has to be looked at very closely by the authorities they have to decide on something like this you know the social security fund and you know i mean this is very much in line with the ilo conventions sri lanka being a member of the ilo will have to take cognizance of these facts and uh, rather than letting the employers take the burden all the time i think uh, other stakeholders especially the government will have to step in and see that something is done so pasin to have i overstepped my time or uh, all right okay yeah you are just reading the time <laughs> okay <laughs> so with that note i would like to you know Uh, stop for now but you know we will be available for questions if any okay uh, uh, thank you very much mr prasad so uh, that concludes the panel discussion session and uh, we have some limited time also so we will try to accommodate as much as question as much number of questions as possible uh, i will first uh, direct this question to mr uh, adamali sir in a, one of participants have asked in a liquidation action what is the preference given to teva claims 
so under the Companies Act, Pasindu, claims, labor claims have a priority. And uh, that includes claims of EPF, ETF, awards from the uh, industrial, under the Industrial Disputes Act, the Termination of Employment of Workmen Special Provisions Act, the uh, awards of an arbitrator or an industrial court, they would all get priority after state claims. So the state claims with regard to inland revenue, I believe, are listed first uh, because the state takes precedence over employees. Uh, debatable as to the uh, morality of that. But nevertheless, employee claims come after. Uh, and so once secured creditors take out whatever they are entitled to on the basis of security, the unsecured part of the assets would be divided in that order. And uh, Teva claims would have priority over general creditors. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So I will take this question. Sorry, to, uh, you, were, you were going to say something. Sorry. Sir. Yes. I think Ms. Balaparbendi was going to say something. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. I think you are, sir, your you mic is muted, sir. Uh, passing this issue came up in commercial uh, high uh, in three winding up cases. Uh, and the issue came up uh, at the same time in three different high courts. Where does the Teva stands? Because uh, EPF is specifically mentioned, ETF is specifically mentioned, gratuity is specifically mentioned in the line schedule in the company, like, but the Teva is not mentioned. So uh, I appeared in one of the cases. And I supervise uh, two juniors appeared in the other two cases. I supervise uh, all three cases, and I filed written some same written submission in all three cases. And uh, this is uh, Honorable Ron Fernando held with me when he was a commercial high court judge, and Justice Kamal Sekar also held with me uh, on this particular issue. And but Justice Ivan Gurratta held otherwise. The order was that the Teva should be considered under. Schedule uh, nine to do under any other statute to do. Sorry, we, we lost you. Sorry, we couldn't get it. We no, lost under, you. Under any other statute to do. Now, if you read, if you take the uh, Companies Act nine schedule, although the Teva is not specifically mentioned, uh, there is it uh, ETF, ETF, and any other statute, any other statutes. So we. Uh, on behalf of the Labor Commissioner, took up the position that Teva could be placed under that category, any other statutes. But of course, uh, in one of the cases I can remember was Nihal Fernando appeared for the other side, and he took up the position, uh, he was for the liquidator, he took up the position that in the 1982 Act, the ETF or gratuity was not mentioned, but in the 2007 Act, that particular act, will, uh, particular act was brought in. So if the government intended to bring the Teva, he should have specifically mentioned. Since the Teva was not specifically mentioned by applying the Ustam Jamris principle, he argued that Teva should not be considered. So Justice Dan Gunaratna held Justice Niha Fernando and uh, held with uh, Mr. Niha Fernando. And, and now all the matters are now in Supreme Court. Leave have been granted by our appeals as well as their appeals. And uh, Mr. Prasanna Jawad, the late Prasanna Jawad, then all the justice was uh, very keen to take up this matter. But of course, due to untimely demise of him, uh, uh, but of course, coming up in next month for argument. Uh, I, will, I, I, I uh, was in the commercial high court when the Honorable Juan Fernando's order was mentioned and cited. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe the court was uh, leaning in, in, in that favor. I was not aware of uh, the order by. Uh, the, the order going the other way. I was under the impression it was uh, only Honorable Juan Fernando's order that was standing. That's right. And just as interesting. Ramani uh, Amarasekar also held with us on this particular point. But uh, at the same time, three different high courts, uh, two held in one direction and the other one held in a different direction. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now I will uh, direct this question to. Uh, Ms. Manoli Jindas, one of the participants have asked whether 
while the case is proceeding in the labor tribunal, whether fundamental rights application can be proceeded in the Supreme Court? Well, uh, it depends. Anyway, under Section 31B3, if there is any connected matter, the labor tribunal has to uh, lay by the case. And so any other, if, if a matter is proceeding under FR, the labor tribunal has to lay by the case until that matter is uh, concluded before the Supreme Court. Now, however, there is also Section 31B5 objection where it uh, uh, the courts must consider when the application was filed. Now, in that case, where fundamental rights is concerned, a very recent judgment by the Supreme Court stated that the fundamental rights cases can go on even if they have been filed before the labor tribunal case because with regard to other courts, if the litigant has resorted to any other courts, they can't come before the labor tribunal. They are after. They can they must first resort to the labor tribunal. So cases, uh, the labor tribunal case can't proceed if there are other cases, they have to lay it by. And if they haven't first resorted to labor tribunal, in general, in all other laws, uh, the labor tribunal action has to be dismissed. But with regard to FR cases, the by a very recent judgment, uh, it had been held that the fundamental rights applications can be uh, resorted to even before coming to the LT. I think, Manoli, you're referring to the judgment delivered just a couple of weeks ago in weeks the Rodrigo ago. matter. Yes. yes. Uh, in the Supreme Court, where they uh, right. said that fundamental rights, the entire cause of action is different, different. Uh, not covered. That's the latest judgment. By yeah, it was just out two weeks ago, I think. It was delivered on 2nd of October 2020. 2nd of October. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So that shows the importance of uh, following the judgments uh, with, with regard to yes. the developments. Yes. And so, Unfortunately, we don't have the SLRs anymore with regard to at least the most recent SLRs. I think the Bar Association must seriously for the junior lawyers, especially rather than going on the web and then looking at each judgment, there should be an easier way for all of the lawyers to access the latest judgments, maybe according to the <laughs> subjects. Thank you very much. And that will be looked into. And uh, next question I will ask from Mr. Prasad De Silva. The, the participant has asked, when a company grants one month's payment of gratuity instead of the statutory prescribed half months, what would be the legal position if the company withdraws it due to its financial constraints? Can retiring employees ask for one month payment for the number of years they have served as of right? What would be the criteria the commissioner would consider in dealing with such complaints? Yeah. I think uh, it's a very important question. Law prescribes only the minimum. There are nothing wrong in giving more than what have been pre prescribed by the law. So there, I know there are companies which give uh, one month instead of half month, and after completion of 30 years or something, there are certain companies which pay two months for each year work. I know at least uh, some of these companies. Right? So. All these practices are fine. Right? I mean, that is perfectly all right, so long as the company can give. And the question is, when they go back to the minimum, because people can say, well, this has been the practice of the company, and I was entertaining this legitimate expectation of getting this uh, enhanced creativity. So it can give rise to an industrial dispute. So labor commissioner per se, I mean, labor commissioner will try to effect a settlement. He will try his conciliation process and uh, failing which this can be referred for arbitration. Arbitration will have to look at uh, as to why the company has made this decision, whether the decision has is, you know, justified. So I think it will be a more, uh, you know, uh, a case-by-case -case approach. What do you think, Manoli? Yes, I think especially with regard to the current situation, uh, the Commissioner of Labor will have to rethink and not go by precedence or say that just because everybody else has got one month, uh, now this workman is also entitled to one month. We'll have to look at it in, with fresh eyes. As long as the minimum statutory uh, limit is observed, the employer should be Cut some, they should cut some slack, I think, for them. And the employer also, I, I believe. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Prasad. 
I, yeah. I wonder employee should the, be able uh, to justify the reason. Yes. Uh, I want. I wonder whether the, uh, the the Commission of Labour will be entitled to proceed under the Payment of Gratuity Act to recover that sum because the Payment of Gratuity Act does not make a provision for a payment beyond the half month. It just speaks of the half month. So okay. he would have to decide that uh, through the mechanism, I think, of arbitration or yes. an industrial yes. court. It yes, not, be not under the Gratuity Act. Yeah. Yeah. Not under the yeah. Payment of Gratuity Act. Yeah. 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 This was uh, resolved in the Court of Appeal in one of the cases because uh, uh, there was a collective agreement to pay one month salary. Uh, Ceylon Bank was Commissioner General of Labor. In that particular case, Justice Anil Gururatta went into this particular issue. And due to the financial constraints, the Ceylon Bank decided that they will pay only the minimum requirement. That's a half a pay. But of course, uh, the employees complained and finally it ended up in the Court of Appeal. There, Justice uh, Anil Gururatna held that even though there are financial constraints, whatever the agreements that they have reached in the collective agreement cannot be compromised. Yes, that is where collective ag agreement has been in place, that's not right. just yeah. the practice. Yeah, that's right. So, but of course, due to the financial constraints, Ceylon Bank wanted to pay only the uh, half a pay. But of course, the court held that uh, that is not possible because what they say is that we are ready to pay the legal requirement, the minimum. But the court said otherwise. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I would I'd like to ask this question from Mr. Sasabadapadapendi, sir. This is with regard to, sir, now there are so many statutory bodies making uh, pronouncements and decisions with regard to this uh, employee relationship, and with, especially with regard to the superannuation benefits. What are What is the remedy available, especially for parties uh, in respect of decisions made by the Commission of Labor and the Labor Inquiring Officers, etc.? Just briefly sum it up so that our topic will be, uh, yeah. I think, complete with that. I think I have to rely on the Diavati's case uh, to explain uh, because in Diavati's case, uh, Justice uh, Tilapodhan held that uh, the uh, Labor Commissioner must first resort to the civil remedy and failing which only uh, the Labor Commissioner should resort to the criminal remedy. But of course, uh, thereafter in several other cases in the Supreme Court held otherwise, now, uh, it's the uh, priority of the uh, discussion of the Labor Commissioner to decide uh, which action that he should take, whether he should take under 38.1 or 38.2 or whether 17 is a decision of the uh, uh, Labor Commissioner. He should decide uh, which one is the most expeditious and most practical way to recover the money. So the similar provisions are there in the other statutes as well, the civil remedy as well as the criminal remedy. So it is the discretion of the Labor Commissioner to decide uh, uh, which way, which which course of action is the best for the employees? I believe, uh, sir, that uh, Diavati was. Uh, it was argued that Diavati was obiter uh, because the matter didn't really uh, revolve around that, and the subsequent two judgments of the Supreme Court and one of the Court of Appeal have seemed to be prevalent now because the Supreme Court refused leave also uh, on on a matter that went up, uh, citing Diavati. Uh, the only issue that uh, arises from this, and I don't know whether that position was really taken in the other two cases, was whether uh, you see you have a strange scenario where the uh, the present board in control of the company uh, are in a position to make the payment but don't, uh, and the only reason the company is in a position to make the payment today is because the board at one time in the past. Uh, defaulted in the payment of statutory dues and turned the company around. So it uh, it leads to a grossly unfair situation where the directors who uh, in fact turn the company around by violating the law uh, are now facing personal liability when the company is now in a position to make the payment uh, and the commissioner goes uh, for the prosecution. So that question of uh, equity needs to be addressed, I believe, at some point. Thank you, sir. I, I will direct this question to Mrs. Jeda, sir. Uh, this question, uh, is a director of a company on a board entitled to EPF, ETF, and could be considered as an employee? Well, uh, the directors can play a dual role. Some directors are employees as well, while others are not. 
if as a director you are also an employee then you are entitled to epf etf but not as a director only on a board of not a for example an independent director on a board who has no then you are not entitled to epf etf it depends on whether you are an employee or not because some directors have a dual role where you are an employee as well as a director also another question uh, i will direct this to uh, ms adamali uh, now when there's a case being inquired that before the labor labor commissioner uh, should the proceedings at the labor tribunal should be laid by uh, when there are proceedings when there is a case i'm sorry i, I didn't hear you clearly when there is a case yeah, yeah. Yeah, when the same matter is canvassed before the labor commissioner and the labor tribunal with regard to certain issue, should the uh, matter at the labor tribunal should be laid by till the matter at the labor commission is taken up, uh, finished, so concluded. So there, there again, I think uh, uh, Ms. Jinnada has uh, addressed it earlier on the basis of uh, Section Thirty One B Five, which speaks of first resorted to, and if it has been heard and determined, then of course the tribunal cannot entertain the matter. if it is a matter in any other forum which is which touches the matter before the labor tribunal in any way uh, even if it's not on all fours with it then the tribunal is bound to lay it by until the other is determined there is in fact a matter which i have received obtained leave in the supreme court where we filed a district court action for damages against the employees and the trade union for disrupting the organization and the employees are before the labor tribunal and we've got leave uh, on the question that the labor tribunal needs to stay until the district court action is heard and decided because if damages are awarded there to the employee on the basis that the workman did something wrong then that is a factor to be considered in the labor tribunal so the high courts have been of the view that unless there is a magistrate's court proceeding uh, going on one doesn't need to stay the labor tribunal proceedings but i believe that's incorrect because it's in any forum including the commission of labor right uh, so i will wind up the session by uh, asking this final question from mr prasad de silva one of the uh, uh, attendees have asked uh, can an employer hold off an employee's gratuity until all outstanding loans such as vehicle loans are settled <laughs> as i said precise no <laughs> because uh, 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 the, the gratuity can only be, you know, forfeited under Section 13 of the right. Payment of Gratuity Act, where the services are terminated by the employer for fraud, misappropriation, causing loss, or causing damage. So, for future uh, to take place, there has to be termination by the employer, okay? and then. Uh, uh, The, the quantum that can be forfeited is the amount uh, equals to the fraud uh, or whatever the damage or whatever. So by way of uh, uh, recovering loans or vehicle loans or lease or so whatever, that way it cannot be helped. Can I just uh, interrupt yes. uh, yeah. on one point in that section thirteen of the Gratuity Act speaks of a termination and not necessarily a termination by the employer. Why I'm emphasizing on this is sometimes an employee can cause a loss and abandon employment. So then the question arises whether section thirteen, in terms of section thirteen, whether a forfeiture can take place. If one looks at the actual provision, the the words of the uh, words of of section 13 does not say termination by the employer however the court of appeal uh, late justice sri skandaraja in a judgment had held the termination is a termination by the employer so it had been interpreted that way so i think that is why prasad was emphasizing on termination by the employer but i still think it is subject to argument that if we go by the provisions of the act strictly and the laws of interpretation says nothing is to be imported or intend we can't interpret uh, or bring in new words to the uh, provision so therefore i feel that even in the case of an abandon because termination cannot occur by way of resignation by abandonment by vacation of post all those are terminations of contract so in that sense if the employee has caused losses by virtue of which the termination occurred then the employer it is arguable that the employer has a right to recover that amount <laughs> thank you so uh, i uh, so with that the session for today is yes,
there is a very recent judgment by justice navas on this particular point ma lanka case uh, uh, he distinguish uh, the bowers case which was the judgment delivered by justice rista daraja i guess uh, so he distinguished the bowers case with ma lanka case ma lanka thank you susanta i actually had missed that <laughs> so uh, with that i would like to thank all the panelists uh, who greatly contributed to, to our session today and some of the viewers have asked for the uh, references of the judgments so our this entire session will be there in the bsl youtube channel so you all can go through the session once again and get the references of the judgment and with that I, uh, with that i pass over the session to tanya to make the conclu conclusion remarks or to tanya thank you pasindu that was a reservoir of knowledge thank you for your time experts thank you for your expertise and your generosity in being able to come on and give us your saturday evening we appreciate it very very much we heard one of our experts saying that the private sector is the engine of the economy another advocating that all hands must be on deck in this time of a changing dynamic in a work relationship empathy is required it is about the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law and the and judgments merely two weeks old being discussed this is how current live and up to date sessions are so important and this is why we appreciate you the participants logging on and asking questions with that concludes the 21st episode of the bas webinar series see you next week thank you all good night